So, I mean, you hold the position of Associate Director of Diversity at the IPA of Institute of uh, Practitioners in Advertising, but perhaps you could briefly outline um, first what IPA does and secondly what your role entails. Yeah, so the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, uh, the IPA, is essentially the headquarters of the British advertising industry. Uh, we're the professional body that supports advertising agencies. We've been around for over a hundred years and uh, are incorporated by Royal Charter. So we're really well known for our um, suite of continuous professional development um, uh, programs. Uh, we export our qualifications to over 60 different markets around the world. Um, we're also really well known for our effectiveness program, which is all about demonstrating the effectiveness of marketing communications. Uh, we host something that's uh, known as sort of the Oscars of advertising, which is our effectiveness awards. And basically our remit is to lead on thought leadership initiatives that really um, future-proof the industry. So things and areas that people in advertising agencies don't have the time to do because it's such a fast-paced business um, is what we try and look after for them. So it could be a topical issue, it could be technology-related, um, diversity-related. And what's really interesting about my role there is that A, it's, it's a relatively new role. So uh, I started, well, I've been at the IPA for nearly 10 years now, um, and I've been in the marketing and strategy team because essentially that's my area of expertise. And um, I was uh, offered the DNI role a couple of years ago and I've helped design it myself. So it's always quite nice to be a first. Um, and then the second thing about it is that it's, it's special because it is leading, not following the agenda. Um, so it is basically uh, leading the diversity and inclusion agenda for the whole of the advertising industry, not just for my own organization. So you really get a bird's eye view of DNI across not just advertising, but the entire creative industries. We have access to the brightest people in agencies, clients, intermediaries, at government, um, at lots of technology companies. So uh, my goal really is to galvanize the collective intelligence of our members and inspirational clients in order to make positive change as, as quickly as possible. No pressure then, obviously. None at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially this year with DNI sort of really coming to the forefront this year, it's been a really interesting time. You must be working with some, some huge brands and some, some big egos. It, it must be a real challenge to, to sort of um, manage all of that. And obviously, you cope well. Yeah, it's really fun. I mean, I like the fact that it's, you know, we're speaking to this agenda is so great because it really lends itself to cross industry collaboration. Mm -hmm. So whereas advertising agencies amongst themselves might compete for business or clients such as, say, say a PNG and a Unilever, are obviously competitors, but when it comes to this particular agenda, most reasonable businesses are more than happy to put their differences aside and come together and work on this in a collaborative way. So I think it's it's really, um, I, I always say it, it's just the, the best agenda to kind of learn from each other from because nobody has cracked it yet completely. So everyone's sort of at different stages in their journey. Well, you say you're, you're leading from the front and maybe we could learn, learn a thing or, or two from you uh, moving forward. It's our first, first attempt today, so hopefully we'll, we'll improve. But I appreciate um, you joining us and, and, and endorsing uh, our choice of, of agenda. So challenges that you have um, and, and the sort of challenges that the advertising industry faces with regards to diversity and inclusion. Uh, maybe you could give us a bit of a, a, bit of a you say, a bird's eye view earlier. Um, that there's been quite a lot of talk about some of the Christmas ads in, you know, going live, you know, so, some of the um, conventions that they've attracted. Maybe you can give us sort of a bit of a, uh, an insight into the role and, and the challenges that you and the industry face. Yeah, so I suppose the unique thing about working in diversity and inclusion in the creative industries and especially in the advertising industry is that there are two aspects to this conversation. The first one is 
the one that's common to every sector, every business in every sector, which is the composition of your organization. So what do your teams look like and who's leading them? Um, and how intersectional are you in your approach with regards to hiring and recruitment and retaining talent? And then the second uh, aspect of DNI for us is portrayal on screen. So I think we're quite uniquely placed because um, with certain with certain other sectors, for example, if I just picked up, say, a sector like architecture, you know. Um, Very topical in this, uh, in this room <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, it's, I mean, they are, um, it's not maybe the business case for diversity with Rico, actually, there's a business case for diversity across every sector, but I'm just speaking relatively over here. So for us, when we're making an ad, does it matter who is actually working behind the scenes in order to come up with the creative concepts for that ad? Absolutely, it does, because you want to be as representative of your audience as possible. Whereas in another sector, like for example, architecture, perhaps the business case is a little less clear um, when you're say designing a building, you know, because it's, it's more of a technical thing over here, it's more creative. So, so we have a very clear reason for why we need to be diverse in, in advertising. Um, and, and with regards to the challenges, um, I think the main challenge in our industry is, is, is basically the fact that we don't have a heritage of, of diversity and inclusion um, in, in advertising. And it, it is a sector that is um, known to be very glamorous. It's, um, you know, traditionally been a uh, very white middle-class um, male dominated, um, slight bit of a superiority complex that goes back to the Mad Men days. I don't know if any one of you has watched Mad Men, but um, it's it sort of um, hasn't really left that era in, in some ways. So what is required uh, if change is to be made is multiple strands of very hard work and commitment in the areas of not just recruitment and retention, but also data measuring and monitoring, linking performance, sales, and profit to diversity strategy, culture change, and target setting. And all of this work needs to be done and underpinned by allyship, sponsorship, and constant tracking of progress from the top down. So there's a lot that actually goes into a successful diversity and inclusion strategy. And it's no wonder that people are struggling because there's no straight line to achieve this. Um, it's also a very personal agenda. It means different things to different people. So just depending on who you are, you will have a particular passion point you know, um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done around things, simple things like language. A lot of leaders are very uncomfortable with the kind of terminology that they can use, um, especially in the year of 2020 with so much happening around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there's so much more at stake, so much nervousness about getting things wrong. Um, so I think the goodwill is definitely there. The conversation has has never been stronger, um, but there is still, I think for us, we are in the phase of challenges around implementation. How do we actually make change happen now, as opposed to, oh, is DNI a business imperative? Is there a business case? I think we've kind of accepted that there is. Um, and we've kind of moved on from that. So, so there is definite progress. Great, and not all organizations are able to appoint a director of, you know, or an associate director of diversity. So in the absence of such an appointment, what advice would you give to someone wanting to learn how they can become more diverse as an organization in everything they do? So it's a good question. So it's really interesting to see that, uh, diversity roles have actually really increased. They are one of the very few job areas um, that people have been actively hiring for during COVID-19, especially after BLM. Um, and I think a diversity hire success really depends on whether or not he or, she, he or she has a seat at the top table and reports directly into the CEO 
as opposed to reporting into HR, which is very frustrating um, and happens a lot. And it's not likely to work if, if, if that is the case, That's because HR is a piece of the puzzle, in my opinion, it's not the entire solution, you know, so you have to have all the different departments working together. And if a diversity hire can convince other departments to report into him or her, explain the, the business case of how all the different departments need to be thinking inclusively, then you actually have someone who could really make a huge difference to the business. But in the absence of that, I do appreciate that budgets are tight at this time. Um, there are lots of ways to go around this. There will be people in your organization who have a passion for diversity and inclusion. So it's really harnessing that passion and commitment and making them accountable to make change happen. And also I think that fundamentally the two things that any organization can be doing is a i always believe that data measuring and monitoring is key um if you don't measure you know the diversity within your organization you don't have a baseline and there's nothing with which you can measure from you won't even know where your gaps are so a i think definitely trying to look at the data that you have um is is crucial and and b you know, an engaged leadership. You must have the top person buy into this agenda um, in, in, in an honest way. Otherwise, it's no good having mid-level management um, working on it because you're not gonna, you're not gonna see much change. Yeah, I mean, if you use the phrase in an honest way, and a lot of the points you're saying, uh, make, making today, being echoed earlier today, um, you're in an in industry, in a sector where Brands can be ruined in seconds, really, mm. um, by someone not implementing the right policies. So, how how transparent is that honesty in in, in appointments, but also on the public facing side in, in campaigns uh, where organisations may be seen to be doing something for the wrong reasons and, and not really have thought through why they're doing it. Kind of mad rush to be seen to be doing something. Um, I think the key thing is to remain authentic. Um, I think consumers today, uh, clients, uh, the talent that you want to work with in your, you, the talent that you want to attract, they're really demanding authentic representation now. Um, and they're demanding fair practices and fair access. So these are things that people can't hide behind anymore. Everything is on the table, up for grabs. Um, and there is a very high price to be paid for getting it wrong. So there are lots of, of different, I think the most obvious sort of solution to future proof any work that's going out is to make sure that you have as diverse a team as possible because that will minimize the risks, um, you know, that, that um, and you know it's very easy for uh, a, a bunch of people who come from very diverse backgrounds uh, to be able to very quickly assess whether or not uh, a certain piece of creative work is going to go down well or not. Um, in our industry, another area that we are now looking at very carefully is around is around casting and how to cast in 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 a fair way because good intentions alone obviously aren't going to make our rehearsal rooms feature a wider range of people. So um, uh, casting is, is something that we're really looking at, reviewing casting practices, um, equal opportunities as well. I mean, every organization should have a diversity policy. Um, and in writing and ideally on their website, no matter how small or big they are. Um, and also, you know, having an up-to-date policy with your suppliers and all the people that you you work with um i think is 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 really key apart from of course training your staff on basic things like unconscious bias um but i think the creative work ultimately is shaped by the people uh behind the scenes so um that is where we need to put our focus for the time being and then the the work will follow as well you know well, thank you so much for yeah, joining us. So Unfortunately, we're out of time, and I was just about to ask you to give a, an example of, of, the, of a company that's doing this really well, but that's probably a very unfair question for me to <laughs> ask, um, but maybe, yeah. an, maybe another time. But great, uh, great to see you, um, sort of back in your own uh, old stomping ground, and um, hopefully you get back to the office soon.
Yeah, yeah, great to see you guys as well. And I uh, look forward to meeting you in person sometimes. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. You take care. Thanks, Leila.